<laughs> yeah, well, we'll just call one CJ, the other one's fine. Okay, welcome everybody to Tuesday, May the 23rd um, committee of the whole meeting. It's hard to believe that month five, month six, we've gone through six months of being here working as a team and if anybody thought it was going to be a, a, a holiday or a coast, I think oh. you know better now. <laughs> Anyways, welcome everybody. I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is a traditional territory of the Tanaha, the Silix, and the Sinix people, and is home to the Métis and many diverse Aboriginal persons. We honor their connection to the land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. Uh, councillors, are there any late items? Seeing none, moving on. If I could have an adoption of the agenda as circulated. So moved. Moved by Councillor Page, seconded by Councillor Woodward. All those in favor, opposed, and that carries. We're going to pop into a really quick uh, closed meeting for a few moments here. And the resolution required is that in the opinion of the Council that the public interest requires that persons other than members of Council and staff and any approved audiences be excluded from this meeting and the special closed meeting of Council continue under Section 90. 1C and L of the Community Charter to deal with matters relating to the following. Labor relations or other employee relations. Discussions with municipal officers and employees respecting municipal objectives, measures and progress reports for the purpose of preparing an annual report under Section 98. Can I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Page, seconded by Councillor Woodward. All those in favour and... Weather's looking like it might change on us. But it's nice not to have to, to rush to dinner. So. talk about it but I think it, we have to wait for I think we're waiting for more maybe information like as we get it okay. as they do a bit more work on it but I mean you can talk about in general in your report yeah but I think any like the details because I mean we're gonna there'll be a presentation yeah I'll just leave it I just yeah. thought it was something yeah more. yeah no no I mean that's well that's what we did I mean I think it's important for people to know that we did it but yeah. I mean okay <laughs> I saw that in the paper the basketball court yep. was laid down. That's pretty, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Oh, and then Mr. Frino had a comment on Facebook I saw. Oh. Well, you know how they have the verified check marks? Like a verified not living in town check mark. <laughs> <laughs> Little globe. Well, like, how many miles away are you? He used to own a large stretch of that track of land there on Trevor Street. Mm -hmm. He pops up a lot. I have some speckle, and inside my drywall, behind the drywall, is plywood. No joke. You could put up curtains yep. with nails. I could sell my house for parts. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the amount of nails that you could probably take out of it, because it's probably a nail every two inches. It's amazing. <clears throat> Yes, it's kind of like a it's kind of like a Russian house. Well built house. Yes. Yes. And banana stucco just weird. It's like, what's going on with this? Yeah, the, <laughs> the weird. Oh, at some nice. point, it was just, swirl. Thing. It was cool yeah, to like do a, a swirl. Thing. Little yes. texture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in the living room, but not popcorn ceiling, but like hand 
blob. Yes. So it goes. Yeah. Somebody did that. But the, the thing with those, it, the only thing it does is it captures any kind of like debris. So spend a lot of time cleaning. Yeah, you're having to wash your house. Yeah, but that's like you got your pressure washer. Not right? for me. Get a little lawn watering at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And driveway watering. I have front and back concrete What's your permeable surface area? I know. I know. It was a different time. Keith, he's pre-you. My house built in 78. There was the city before yeah. Keith and the city after it Keith. I like I like I like that we're in the Keith era. Referencing. So, <clears throat> do we know? Are you? Do you have announcement? Like, are you the new? I'm still waiting for them to. Look at when you are. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't. I'll, oh, okay. You know what my question is? <laughs> yeah, I think you do. I don't know yet. Oh, you don't know yet? Okay. No. It's just like, you know, because that's like, we have to have cake that night or something. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> health, health food. Maybe. Okay. okay. So, you can go? Okay. That's your idea. Hopefully. Welcome back, everybody, and uh, welcome to the media who I've seen have um, joined us now. Uh, we're back into the open meeting. So, um, thank you, everybody, for that. And tonight we don't have a workshop or educational uh, session, but uh, item number eight, the city manager's verbal report. Um, city manager, do you have anything to report this evening? Um, just, um, you know, uh, our focus was on the strategic planning that council did, um, this past week. Um, I did attend the, um, symposium on homelessness in Kalsagar, uh, one of the evenings. I know, um, some others, uh, attended other, other sessions. Uh, I thought that was, you know, well done. Uh, there, just for people's knowledge, there is a regional committee, Selkirk College is leading that in our region, and, um, you know, the three municipalities, Nelson, Kaskar, and Trail, all funded, funded uh, or put in the core funding for that, and Selkirk College was able to get uh, some large grants to allow that work to go on, and that will continue this summer with... Um, uh, um, Selkirk students that will be engaging within all our communities. Um, um, so that so that was um, work that's been going on. Um, you know, been uh, everyone knows we Chris Johnson's a new GM, so you know, been able to introduce him around the city as well. Um, and uh, joined some of the councillors on a public works tour. We. Um, visit our facilities that started from well not quite source but where source goes into our our treatment facility um, and to the other end of the system where <laughs> our uh, used water is treated before it uh, is discharged into the Kootenai River and um, I think that was quite informative and you know it showed the level of investment that we've made especially on the treatment side of that um, over the last number of years there's an, another large project um, that is going on this year to complete that work and um, as council's aware we've done a, a wastewater treatment um, master plan and that calls for for the first stage to do the liquid waste management plan which is a two to three year process and will involve um, consultation with the, the public and it's really the roadmap of how we manage liquid waste into the future. And uh, I think that's about it. Thank you. And I guess I'm um, off to the FCM with Councillor Lautenberg here um, bright and early tomorrow morning. Um, is now a good time to 
time to ask? I'm there, sorry. Is now a good time to ask? Would there be like a schedule kind of? I think we talked about this at strategic planning with regards to like, um, like, is it quarterly or something like um, updates that kind of align with the capital projects and that sort of stuff? That's your zone, right? Sort of is like building that schedule. Yeah, well. I'll work with Chris. Chris does a financial update that will show the financial investments that we've, we've made. And I know that the mayor is um, looking to, for that to be a, you know, a focus of, of one of our meetings. So we'll build in um, you know, a bit more detail with the update of those, especially that capital project. But we'll cover that whole financial plan. Where are we with revenues? Where are we with expenditures? And where are we with the, the capital program? So yes. Okay. Um, I don't want to add too much extra like no. slides and photos and running around, but just because there's just so much visibly yeah. happening in this city, it's great to be able to um, showcase what the status yeah. is. Yeah. And that's part of why we want to have a full um, meeting. And so hopefully, I mean, all, all our meetings are fairly full. So a business meeting where we get that quarterly re report out, um, it, it might be again a, a day that we start a little bit earlier to make sure that we get get through any business that's urgent that we have to do that day as long as well as giving more time it's always i've always felt it hasn't been quite long enough sometimes it's really straightforward you've you've read it all and uh the previous cfo got off light on the questions but i think that the whole thing here is not so much about questions but making sure that we're maybe flushing out the detail a bit a bit more so it will take um more time and i know that that uh Chris and Kevin in, enjoy getting to talk about all the great things that are going on. So giving them more, more time is, yeah. is a good thing. And I know we're, you know, Chris Johnson is looking at uh, some opportunities to, you know, make it easy for the public to, you know, if they walk by a site, you know, whether we use a QR code or something that you can go, oh, I want to know what's going on here. And, and we'll, this you know, was planned. This wasn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. This you was know, a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The example came up of the you know the sidewalk in on Victoria Great Street. Street. We have this you know collapsed sidewalk, and you know can we you know put information on it? You know, easy. Someone walk by, go, oh, want to hear, and it would bring you to our web page that talks about all our projects, and you would see what that that you know what was going on there. So we are um, uh, kicking around some. Uh, good ideas, but also for the public, we do, uh, you know, you know, put all that information around our major projects on on our web page and try to keep that up to date. So if people are interested, you know, that's a good place to go. Thank and, you. You know, we can talk about um, as far as these quarterly updates. So you know, the first one would be um, kind of that half year check in because we're already you know usually go to the end of June and then sort of do that something in. End of July or August, but you know if we do make it a, a bit of a larger piece, um, maybe bringing in a, a Colin Innes or something like that to kind of talk a little bit more about what's going on because I know they really appreciated the time to be able to do that with you during the budget process this year. And a couple of them mentioned that for them it was the you know one of the best budget cycles they've gone through, just being able to go and talk about these things because they're excited about the stuff that they're doing and appreciate the opportunity to share with you guys. So. Yeah, kind of build it out so it's not just about uh, dollars and cents, but also about the cool stuff that's happening around town. And that's also good use of that our workshop education session time. So yeah. when there's a, a real sort of quick um, update where we can give them 15 or 20 minutes and they come in and they just really just specifically talk about um, one project to give as much more clarity to us and then the public also has that information at hand. Um, to hear about projects that are going on. So, excellent. Um, uh, Chris, did you have anything for Kevin? Are you finished? Yeah. Okay. It was hot off the press that um, the four way stop project has been awarded now and, and we'll go ahead. Nice. So, that's exciting. Nice. Excellent. Um, Anything more from finance? Yeah, so tax notices mailed today. Um, oh, so can't wait. Yay. <laughs> check your uh, mailbox uh, daily, uh, you know, and, and I guess the message would be. I guess the message would be, um, you know, giving uh, hey. the mail carriers a, a bit of 
time to get things out the door and stuff. But um, you know, if you are listening to this and uh, a week or so has gone by and there's nothing in your mailbox, then just reach out to us and we'll uh, make sure you have your um, property tax notice in your hands. Homeowner grant. And don't forget yes. to apply. Make sure you claim grant. your homeowner grant online before uh, July 4th. So can, can I ask a question for those people that don't have a, a computer and such, um, is it possible for those people to come into City Hall and have one of our um, wonderful customer service reps um, help them with that um, process at the front counter? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can do that for you. We can um, act as your representative and do that for you online. Okay. But we'll, we'll do the online part if you want to come in. But there is also a, a phone number you can call and do it on the phone. But, um, yeah, do it on a computer, do it on the phone, or come on in and we'll just make sure that it gets done. That's the most important thing. Just get it done. Yeah. And the other reminder is <clears throat> if you're late, we legislatively, we have to charge you the penalty. So make sure you give yourself enough time. Invariably, someone, something comes up that you, you know, um, that, you know, people miss and, you know, and there, you know, there's things that, you know, we wished, you know, we might be able to help people with, but we can't. So, you know, there's, you know, you can walk your check down and give it to us two weeks later with, a, you know, but just make sure uh, it has time enough to clear your bank because what has happened in the past is, um, you know, some, you know, folks have kind of miscalculated, um, their funds and some other check has come out ahead of ours and then there's not enough funds for our check your you know our check gets um not uh, honored and you know you know the customer has gone in and cleaned this all up but it's too late you've already missed your payment so give yourself you know a week to make sure any anomaly um, is taken care of um, and because uh, you don't want to pay that penalty it's it's a steep penalty for a couple days of interest that you might not have got uh, you don't want to risk the penalty for that it's 10 percent isn't it yeah. yes sure is <laughs> okay are you dumb you can relate <laughs> <laughs> sadly yeah yeah That's i can i can relate too so it's not a perfect world um there any Anything else? Okay. Question, Councillor Payne. I think I ask this every time, and I'm sorry if you've explained what's happening, but is there a way that we're planning to move towards not sending everything by mail, especially in my household, because there are, well, not especially in my household, I'm sure there are other households, we have four owners, so we get two. We don't just get one, we get two. So... Um, is there an opt-in? Is there a way that next time they go out, we can ask people if they're interested yeah. to get it? We don't. We sometimes, like now knowing that the bill is coming, we'll look in our mailbox, but we get so little mail yeah. that we wouldn't know that we didn't get it. Yeah. No, for sure. We will, we will look into seeing if we can provide another way of, of getting your, your tax notice to you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's inevitable that at some point we'll stop doing this, right? So um, trying to get a little bit of traction on alternative ways to deliver that information is smart. So, yeah, we'll look awesome. at that. Thank you. Any other questions about the looming tax bills that are arriving in a mailbox near you? Okay. And, uh, okay, council reports. Anybody have a report that they want to give about anything or everything. Wow, all quiet. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> I think, um, so just a couple of hitting the waves. I mean, because it, it has been busy because of strategic planning, so I think we've all been wrapped up in that, and there was, um, you know, assessments and questions to ask before that that the facilitator wanted, so we've been busy doing all of that. I think I believe I mentioned last time that I had met with uh, our new youth uh, climate core team. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to hear what their what their name is going to be. I, I, it seems kind of like a funny thing, but I think it would be nice if they had a nice um, name that was reflective of of Nelson. And I know that they were going to give it some.
thought over the next little while. So, and uh, they're definitely a keen group, and I'm looking forward to seeing them at the uh, markets and other places um, around town. I also met uh, with, uh, as I go every month, the first Tuesday of the month is the Nelson and Area Fentanyl Task Force um, group, and I was at that meeting um, a couple weeks ago. And then I met with, uh, last week, I, week before last, I met with uh, Ken Kolesnikov, who's the uh, owner of the Kolesnikov uh, Mill. And just for an update on issues in um, forestry and looking at, you know, how it's affecting you know, the work that he does in the area and th that um, concept that the government is um, putting forward about getting the right mill to the, uh, right log to the right mill is uh, very important in our area for our mills to stay up and and operating and that the mass timber facility is is doing um doing well he's got no uh, no complaints it's still a kind of a new thing there is the provincial government uh has struck an advisory a group that's been operating for a while they have looked for um somebody from local government to put their name in I, i'm sure a few people have i did I did uh, throw my uh, name into the ring for contemplation. I'm sure they probably want somebody with a deeper background in, in forestry, perhaps, but it, that table is already, you know, well, they have a group of foresters already at that table. So I was hoping that perhaps I would bring a different perspective to the, the table. So we'll see. We'll see if I get the invite to, to represent UBCM there. Um, I did meet with uh, Carol uh, Howard uh, in the last couple of weeks. She's the president of the Senior Society. Um, she has uh, concerns, as many residents in the city do, around what's happening at 818 Vernon Street um, going forward. And so it was just an opportunity to hear from that group because the seniors are um, concerned about the activity and the um, increase of activity there that also um, oftentimes blocks their doorway and access for uh, seniors to get into the building to uh, utilize the building and their, and their spaces that they have in the um, Civic Center. And let's see what else. So, oh, so I went on Monday last week uh, to the Ryan Dowd Homeless Training and Community Conversation. It was part of the the two days and Monday just fit better with me than to go to the homeless one, which, which I think that perhaps Councillor Payne or Councillor Page who are there will probably talk about. And I went to that and it was um, these courses. And so this um, Ryan Dowd is very, uh, he's very engaging. And so he has this video um, series that you kind of watch. And what was very nice about the presentation that happened at Selkirk is that they brought in one of their social workers which was great, so that normally you would you could potentially do this Ryan Down work at home kind of by yourself. So you could go through the sort of 90 minutes and then there, you know, that you'd be you'd be done, has come to a little summary. Um, and then the next week you would kind of go and do another one. Well, we did four of them. And after each one, we had an opportunity to have a little break and a small discussion within the, the group that the um, social worker uh, facilitated. And that was really helpful because it, it drew people out that maybe didn't want to talk. But it also, you know, you're not just left there sort of staring at your screen. You got to have that interaction. And so you kind of go like, yeah, that's that's what I heard. Or, oh, I didn't hear that part. And it's always nice to have that discussion like we do around the, the council table of like, oh, that's that's a different way to look at that. So um, there was a very good um, conversation. Now, Selkirk and, and perhaps um, Kevin can speak more to this is that, uh, has the rights to this programming for one year. And there's more programs than the four that I took, which was around um, homelessness and de-escalation. And there, Selkirk could be putting more opportunities for it again. So I think we should keep our eye open for those of you that might be interested if they repeat this or there are other programs. And I, I just, I found him interesting the way he presents. He's very, very skilled presenter working in his house or wherever he does with his green screen. And it's, very, um, very interactive, and so um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to prop to take some more of the programs that they offer, and I think that's all part of the program that Selkirk is running around um, homelessness 
and such. So it was it was really good. I attended. Um, Sarah, um, our corporate officer, uh, Chris in the back was there. We also had. Who am I missing? We had. Um, um, hmm, Tra Tra Terry, I believe. Terry, our manager of um, youth services, was there, which was great. And it was a real mixed group of people. What was interesting, there was social service providers, and then there was kind of like the, 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 the city stiffs, and then there was actually groups from like, there was a large group from banking industry. So it really did make for a really interesting mixed group. But again, you know, banking, just a reminder that, you know, trying to help people in terms they come in, they need to have bank accounts set up, how to improve your customer service um, relationships with your with your clients. It was it was interesting to see the different people that were um, there and participating. So that was um, very good. And I did a performance appraisal for one of our um, new directors of the police board. It's part of my job. Who knew these jobs that you get when you're the chair of the police board? Um, and that went really well. Uh, uh, Devin Curran, who's familiar to, I think, many of you in the room. Um, he actually was going to run for city council at one point, and then when this opportunity came up, he thought that um, this would be a very interesting community um, job to be doing in the meantime while he contemplates his further maybe coming to be a city councillor at some point. But he's been, um, he's been great. He has a strong voice at the table. It's great representation in terms of uh, somebody who's younger so um he's been very valuable contribution uh to the to the police board um we're talking about the police board this coming thursday and friday and part of the reason why i'm not going to fcm is it's the bc association of police boards mm -hmm. nelson is the host city nelson is rarely the host city because most of the independent police forces are in the lower mainland so of course it's much easier for them to organize their annual meeting um at the at the coast but we are the hosts this um, Thursday and uh, Friday. So, and I did attend um, while well, Councillor uh, Page was at the homeless. I did um, attend the RDCK annual um, session to prepare officials for uh, emergency response. So that was uh, hour on Tuesday morning where their new um, uh, emergency response person who is replacing <laughs> Chris in the <laughs> in the the back um, did a presentation for uh, the back. directors of the um, RDCK on what the roles and responsibilities of elected officials are uh, in time of uh, emergency. So that's my report, and I'll let somebody else give a report. But if anybody has any questions um, as we go along, um, I'm also happy with answering anything I can possibly answer. So. Anybody? Do you, either of you guys want to talk about the homeless thing? Leslie, it looks like Councillor Payne. Looks like you're getting the signal from Councillor Page. I am. I, am. I talk a lot, so. What? I talk a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anybody, if anybody doesn't get anything out right here. But. <laughs> what? Um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, it was, it, it's been a full two weeks. Let's just put it that way. It's yeah. been full. Uh, the tour of where our water comes from and where it ends up, absolutely fascinating. Most of that information is available online, but if you ever get a chance as a you know, citizen or a business or a school to go on those tours, just jump on it because um, it's really critically important in my opinion, for everyone in our city to understand where the water comes from, what it goes through. This is an incredibly precious resource that looks like it is all around us forever and always, but we don't know. The world is getting a little weird, so let's just make sure that we care for what we have in a good way. Um, that was exciting. The Yeah, the Homelessness Summit, the work that uh, Selkirk College is doing led by Jamie Jones and her incredible team around trying to better understand uh, the dynamics of this really intersectional challenge that has so many roots and so the, where the uh, solutions are so complex. So having this opportunity to come together as uh, government service providers 
and, and lived experience. We saw a tremendous panel of lived experience that was facilitated by um, someone very skillfully to give everyone an idea of what that day looks like when the first question was, did you sleep last night? Where'd you sleep last night? And did, did you get breakfast after that? And sort of led you through that day of having a better understanding of what that experience looks like. Um, spoken by the people who are living that experience every single day. Um, many valuable connections and it was the, the fascinating thing to me was this opportunity for regional collaboration. So um, all of the communities, the Tri-Cities, I guess we call them, were there, both those service providers and there were um, city staff and politicians all pretty passionately um, invested in working together to move us forward. Uh, the, I just wanted to do a couple of uh, save the dates. Is that okay as part of my council report? Sure. Because I did sign up today. The fire chief reminded me that we have an opportunity to go out into the woods together. And he, uh, he said, was I willing to drag sticks or did I want to do something else? And I'm like, dragging sticks sounds good to me. So I signed up for this Saturday from 10 till 1. Um, if you haven't signed up yet, it's only 30 volunteers, so you've got to jump in there and get your spot now. Don't wait. Uh, it's going to be fun. It looks like the weather's going to be decent. It'll be a nice day to be up and get a better understanding again of one of the, I don't like to use the word threat, but it is a threat to our community of not uh, thoroughly maintaining that area, the interface where the forest meets the city and um, how we can make that safer for all. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to report on is I did um, attend uh, on Sunday the launch for the run for Aubrey and that was a story that I saw. I know we were all invited to Nelson Community Services when they had their 50th anniversary and Amy Bohegan had done a a series of um, small films and one of them was the story of Aubrey and his mother Jessica and Aubrey died of a drug poisoning um, and since then his mother spent a fair bit of time running around um, the government the legislature in Victoria and now she's taking that a step further she started actually running after a, a few people spoke about how critical it was for us to get it together on this one. We're, we're saving lives. That's what this is about. Whether, and there's a lot of different mechanisms for us to do that. And having those discussions everywhere, anywhere about stigma, about who uses drugs, why that's looked at in a different way than there are other addictions and other challenges out there that people force and um, face. So it was, uh, it was good to be out there. As a, and as they started to run, sort of a hurricane wind came in and the rain started and um, she's on her way. So if you do want to um, support that in any way, but it's mums against the harm. Um. Thank you. Also a wonderful organization and a, another mother who lost a child through drug poisoning also spoke that um, lives here in Nelson. Mothers, friends, husbands, wives, children. So that was just part of the busy week. Lots of different things happening here in our beautiful city. More to come. Anybody else? Very quiet group tonight, so it looks like we are able to break a few minutes early to go to um, dinner. So if we could have a motion to recess. Okay, moved by Councillor Woodward, seconded by Councillor Lockenberg. Um, I don't think there's any discussion about recess, but uh, all those in favor? Okay, and that carries. Thank <laughs> you.
The um, item number 11 was to be the cultural presentation, but I'm just, is, okay. So what I'm going to do, that's fine because I realized, so um, just so everybody understands that um, we had a little bit of miscommunication about the time for the presentation of the, of the uh, cultural um, presentation and uh, the Nelson Museum and Archives Gallery is having their AGM tonight. So we're trying to still have them come to do their presentation. And I'm sure as it was interesting is that, oh, it only takes us 40 minutes to have the AGM. And I'm like, well, this will be the year that'll take an hour and 10. So um, it took what, 35. I, yeah. what I think I will do um, if council is agreeable, because of course we've passed the agenda the way it stands, is that perhaps we will do um, public uh, participation if council is agreeable for us to do 12 and then when Astrid gets here, we will do the council presentation. Is anybody um, averse to that small um, change? Okay, and I do know that there's a few people in the audience that want to um, speak. I'm going to start with... Uh, Brenton, if you want to come up and and grab the seat, you're familiar with how this works, and I will read the public participation statement. Public participation period is limited to 15 minutes in total. A speaker may only address council once for a maximum of three minutes, unless authorized otherwise by unanimous vote of council members present. Speakers must res restrict their remarks to items that are listed on the meeting agenda. Speakers must not address council regarding a matter for which a public hearing must be held or has been held prior to council's consideration of the matter or adoption of the bylaw. Speakers must not address council regarding a permit for which public notice must be given or has been given prior to council's consideration of issuance of the permit. Speakers shall address all comments through the mayor or the presiding member. So there we go. And just remember your name and where you live, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brenton Raby. I live at 512 Hendricks. I can be brief. I believe that people who do not live in Nelson have been experiencing the overdose crisis, safety issues, and safety issues that are occurring downtown and in our public spaces differently than me, who lives downtown. It is reverting back to the dark days of three to four years ago perhaps a verified not living in Nelson badge. So, so those who don't live here and don't have to live with it can be easily discounted. These days colloquially now could be known as the Keith days. Days of overdose, death and urban rot in my opinion. I believe that there is institutional bias happening at the city of Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Britton. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you did. Somebody else wanted to speak, so. Oh, thank you. I'm Elizabeth Cunningham, and I'm here to 
speak for the birds and to propose that Nelson become a bird for the city. So I am volunteering with Nature Canada's Bird Friendly City Certification Program. Nature Canada has been a voice for wildlife and nature for over 80 years. They have developed this program since 2019 to create safer conditions for bird populations in Canadian urban environments. Bird populations are undergoing a long-standing population declines. The overall bird population in North America has dropped by 3 billion since 1970. Financially supported by Environment and Climate Change Canada, Nature Canada is working with local partners to implement bird-friendly actions in cities across Canada, including Vancouver, Toronto, London, Calgary, and Lions Bay and Saanich in BC, among others. So the steps to be certified, which um, would be uh, something that uh, I am asking and see if, if council can be involved with, are to establish a bird team, these are nature group, groups, and that can involve municipal staff, local businesses. I've already established quite a team, and that includes um, the Climate Hub, and um, Neighbors United, and Wild Sight representatives, and a lot of individuals who also come on board with this. We need to identify areas of concern, such as protecting natural habitats and reducing light pollution. And I know that um, we are working on that. Uh, I, and, uh, this, I think, uh, also overlaps with the Nelson Next kind of um, priorities. So, when, and then we need to work with the community and city council to address these concerns. Um, there are certain bird-friendly city criteria that needs to be met, and there's a rubric uh, along with that that I, I have sent it to city council and submitted it. I don't, I, I don't know if you remember that or I have received it, but there's, there's certain criteria there that we need to look at. And I've already begun work on that for the last year and a half. And one of the criteria is to establish a, or, or to celebrate a um, bird migratory day, which I, I did last week. At, and uh, we had a nice turnout for that. So what, uh, working towards this bird friendly city possibility is, is already rolling. And I'm prepared to do a lot of that work. Um, so I think that, as I said, it's, uh, this initiative is consistent with the City of Nelson's Nelson Next program uh, in that Nelson's natural ecosystems and the services they provide are all to do with a healthy, abundant, and diverse city. I am requesting that maybe staff um, investigate the possibility of support from Council for the Bird Friendly City Certification. There will be no initial cost for this, for this space in, in the program. Um, down the, down the road, as we get more and more involved, some staff time will be required in this process. So this is an opportunity to celebrate and promote bird conservation efforts that the City of Nelson, as well as the many community organizations have already undertaken. I know there's lots of work being done in this, good work being done in this way. The Bird Friendly City Certification would be a badge of honor to recognize the progress Nelson is making already to mitigate the biodiversity declines on our planet. Thank you. Um, I believe looks like council has a couple of questions, so I'm going to start with Councillor Lockenberg, then I'm going to go to Councillor Woodburn. Thank you. Um, can you just explain again two things that I wasn't clear on? The first was just about the light pollution. I, I hadn't heard what um, what effect that would have on on bird population. So just briefly on that, the second thing I'm curious about is what exactly would the city need to do so just so if we refer to staff as you're requesting i just want a better understanding about what what the ask is well initially um one of the criteria in order to become a bird friendly city in the first place is it requires the municipal participation of the city council so that's just um endorsing that that this is something that we would like to work towards together great okay and then the light pollution Thing. Uh, can you explain the light pollution? You said that there was, because that is something light we... Light pollution. Yeah. Is that what your question is? Yeah. Um, well, certain municipalities across Canada, like Toronto, <laughs> um, put an effort into turning, out, turning the lights out at night in municipal buildings in, in particular. Because okay. there's a, a huge loss of bird life, mm. uh, particularly in migratory times when the birds fly into the windows. 
There's okay. also the possibility that some places have done to legislate, perhaps, um, treatment of, of municipal buildings' windows so that the <coughs> birds are not attracted or there, there's something that protects them from doing that. Okay. Um, or you could even perhaps suggest that new buildings have this aspect incorporated into the building. That's just one way that the birds could be protected because I know personally from being a bird bander years ago that um, we lose every spring and fall during marketary times hundreds and hundreds of birds because they're, they're attracted to the light. Mm -hmm. They climb to the windows and, mm -hmm. and you know, they're, they're killed. Right. It's a huge loss. It's really significant. Mm -hmm. That's just one thing that could help. Well, Mayor, if I may, yes. um, this is a bit unusual, I, I understand, but if one if understanding is you're looking for a sort of a letter, that should be something I, I'd like to refer to council, I mean sort of refer to staff to write the letter to to begin the process or, or undertake the processes you're requesting, because I do think that's an important thing and relatively easy thing we can do to, uh, to advance this initiative, which I think is admirable and, and I'm really... I want to thank you for your work. Thank you. I mean, there are many organizations already part of the bird train team and uh, ready and willing to be involved. Fantastic. I have some brochures and information. I don't know if I sure. should leave them with you. Yeah. So, you if you don't mind, Councillor Lockenberg, so you've got a motion just that we're going to refer to staff to do some further investigation and mm -hmm. understand the process better, and then yeah. something would come back if, or or if it fits within our criteria for staff just to go ahead and write a letter of support. Yep. But may I go to um, Councillor um, Woodward and then we'll come back and get a seconder and vote? Sure. Yep. <clears throat> it was answered for me. Okay. So can I, can I just ask one question? Um, my understanding is cats have a big impact on cats. <laughs> bird <laughs> populations. Cats <laughs> okay. Yes, they are. Con it is a difficult one. Uh, I have spoken to the SPCA here in Nelson about what can they do or what can we do together. I, I asked specifically about feral cats. Mm -hmm. I have quite a large collection or a population of feral cats in Nelson. What they do is they try to um, uh, uh, catch as many as they can and, and neuter them, but that's, that's what they do. Um, I think the only thing we can do, well, I'd be open to a suggestion, but certainly ed education again is a big component there. Because we know that cats kill millions of birds every year, and it is a huge problem. And that certainly has contributed to that decline of 3 billion birds across North America in the last 50 years. Cats are significant in that regard. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify because I had heard that and just wondering if that's part of. I assume that's part of the work then is to try yes, to figure that's out one of the something. Criteria okay. That we at least address it somehow. Mm -hmm. Councillors, any further questions for um, our presenter <coughs> at public time? Okay, we've had a motion just to um, refer. Okay, it's been seconded. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Now, John. John, thank you. Yeah, John Schnarr, um, a teacher more years than I should admit here in Nelson for 48 years, uh, and a son of an avid birder. I'm also speaking of this, but from a very different person, from a different perspective in support of the bird friendly city idea. Um, there's so much that's already happening in Nelson that's actually already supportive of this. Um, I had an experience a couple of weeks ago where uh, there was a tree that uh, a couple of your employees worked half time for Nelson Hydro and half time for the city, and a tree was up in the wires and needed to be removed. These guys were, they were so conscious. Well, if there's any nesting birds up there, we're not going to do anything. They were they were just on it already. And, and but there was clearly some branches that needed to come down. And my son came out and said, "Well, there's uh, birds that nest in a hollow in that tree." So they took the stuff down immediately to take down and left the hollow so that they could still be used by, uh, by the Northern Flickers that are there. So there's already the real staff consciousness and then also in part of your arborist that you have here, I can't remember his name right now, but he's extremely conscious already of this. There's a lot happening. But the, the point that I wanted to make with regard to this is sometimes I know you can, you can see uh, different interest groups coming to you and everybody wants to get on the bandwagon with their interest groups. I think this is broader than this because 
that all the work that you're doing around climate change and planning for the future, this kind of thing is, can be, potentially be a real consciousness changer. Mm -hmm. Everybody looked out the window when there were kids, when there were birds, when, there were, when you were a kid, you saw birds out in the yard. If there was a feeder in the block, you heard them or you saw them as you were walking to school. And a lot of the things, there's a lot of technical things that you've got to do around tech, climate change. There is regulation that's going to have to take place to move forward with that. But if you can tap into like really broad experience that almost everyone has had of protecting wild animals in your yard, not too many kids that haven't been on board with that, and adults that weren't on board with that at some point. I think there's really a, a really big opportunity to do that. And around the light pollution, for example, I've noticed that on our street, whenever they replace a shield, you know, on a broken light, they now have the ones that are closed on the top, so the lights just going down where to light the street. I mean, that's what we want to light is the street. We don't need to light the sky. And one of the other implications of light monitor, light pollution, is it disrupts migratory flow as well. Because mm -hmm. when you've got large, bright spots, are birds attracted to that? Yes. Were they there? Are they supposed to be there? Well, they're there because of humans. But, but Nelson's already addressing that problem by putting, by putting the new ones seem to all have shields on when they go up and they replace them. So my, my, the only thing that I really want to say is that I just think that there's a broad, it's, this is something that's broader, that appeals to <coughs> consciousness of an environment that we're creating in the city. Um, even around heat control, having more trees, I mean, you know, that's pretty common now to know that cities that are devoid of trees are a lot hotter. Hmm. If, they, if, we, if we promote those trees, which if you're a bird friendly city, you're probably going to be protecting and promoting the trees as much as you can. It also achieves the goal of creating lower temperatures in paved areas. Hmm. So there's a lot of conjunction with this with other policies that you've already adopted. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Yeah, thanks, John. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. I want to thank Brenton, Elizabeth, and John for coming to um, take advantage of the public participation that we have on our cow meeting um, schedule days. You're more than welcome to stay for uh, the rest of the meeting if you like. And I'm going to now go back to item number 11, our culture presentation from the Nelson Museum Archives and Gallery. And they're going to be providing a brief presentation showcasing the archival digitization work that they have been doing. The Nelson Museum Archives, Archives and Gallery has been working on digitization of Shaw TV, BHS, and other format videos, and some have some great gems showcasing the history of Nelson. And I hope you don't have any clips of when I was on City Council. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Or you haven't gotten to those years yet, because I know they're out there on Shaw somewhere. So um, Astrid and JP, come on up to the front and we'll let you take over with some help from Sonia there. I'm so glad that we got it straightened out about getting you here.
council meetings are all on there. <laughs> we have to dig through them. Um, So there were some fun times there in the old city hall. We have a we have a light agenda because one of our delegations um, had to cancel due to personal reasons. So we have we have a moment. So let's let's give it a try. And if not, we will for sure reschedule you. But I'm just concerned that in the interim that you might find one of those gems that has me actually on the <laughs> one of those 1990s gems. Oh. Okay. You've got them up on Insta and Facebook, don't you? I've the seen them. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about um, um, I youth, uh, Mayor Council and. Citizens of Nelson, I'm sure you've heard me talk a few times about how vital the archives are. And I'm only tonight speaking about the archives specifically. We, of course, have the gallery space, and we have the museum collection, museum exhibition, all of our educational programs, the decolonization work that we do. This is really just about the archives, because we wanted to talk about how quickly archival material can deteriorate. Mm -hmm. Once it deteriorates, it's gone. And so when we're looking at things like the Nelson Daily News digitization that we've been working on for years and years, um, it's really exceptional that we can use that now as searchable uh, research material for people not just in Nelson but across uh, the country and beyond. And then also looking to uh, the Shaw TV and other audiovisual material that we have been digitizing. We've been really successful with grants through the federal government, uh, through CBT, uh, through the Oscar Foundation and through private donations and foundations in order to ensure that we can showcase. Um, and the particularity with audiovisual material is that the technology is, <laughs> JP's been scouring kind of the continent to find even the machines that will play, mm -hmm. like Geomatic machines, and then the Geomatic machine that we got from eBay didn't work, and then we had to send it off to be fixed by something like the one expert in North America or who knew how to fix those machines. So if we're thinking about that kind of technology, the longer we wait to digitize these kinds of things, the more likely it is that they will be completely lost and unseeable. So. Councilor Woodward. Through the mayor. Um, I was wondering how long, uh, so just talk about a few things like film, slides, and let's say like, uh, VHS, like what kind of time frames are we talking about here for for them to be to be actually be visible? Well, like how long do you think that they will still last? Yeah. Well, VHS actually lasts less time than uh, music rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, VHS is now thirty five years old, something like that, mm -hmm. and it is deteriorating now. Um, so if we don't do this within the next mm -hmm. decade, 20 years, the quality of the VHS will not be good enough. Yeah. What, about, what about film? What about slides or like? <clears throat> slides uh, can last. Um, things like microfilm as well, very good. Uh 
Okay. A few different things. Um, but everything has a shelf life. Uh, so getting these on its digital format, um, backing them up in different formats, it, it's going to make them last, make them last, and make them accessible as well. The problem with uh, VHS is not many people have got VHS recorders now. Mm. Uh, so if we can put things on um, things like YouTube, just make put them into MP4s, and uh, they are accessible to, uh, to people. We have one ancillary room with the bunker that's dedicated now to the audiovisual material mm -hmm. that we have of various formats and <laughs> shelves and shelves of it. We have um, radio production as well, produced in um, by, by the Nelson radio station, going back to the 60s, certainly. Um, produced by Ross Fleming, uh, so production there. So we've got recordings of Cutney Music Festival. We've been buying all sorts of different equipment, as, as Ash just says. Uh, but um, now we're really starting to digitize the material and we um, you know, to get really the summer that we're going on uh, all of this. The Shaw collection, which mostly dates from the late 80s to the early 90s, has a huge range of uh, uh, programs, maybe a thousand programs we're talking here. And a lot of it's cultural events, so we've got festivals, the Snowfest, the BC Winter Games. Um, we've got uh, environmental protests at Lasley Creek and uh, various conferences. Um, there was a conference at, um, well, two, two conferences at uh, one at Falga, one at LVR, uh, called, called uh, Get High on Nature, the conference was called. <laughs> and uh, yes. but they have Elizabeth May. That tracks. The Green Party <laughs> is, was there. You know, also all these people were were drawn to Nelson, and it was a huge, huge environmental conference. Uh, so we have the record of that. Uh, we have the theatre productions as well, other than the, the Capitol, uh, but other places as well. Um, so um, I know Margaret Stacey is very excited about this collection, <laughs> um, and we have very much the cultural figures, the sporting figures, because we've got lots of sport. Um, political figures, the, the business figures from, the, from that period, um, yeah. multiple people, people who we know today, um, the likes of Andy Grace or uh, Ken Moo, um, Nelson Becker. Nelson Becker. <laughs> um, this was all produced, um, the short studio was on Ward Street, so mm. it's just down sort of the road from here. And they were covering everything really that was going on. Um, some of the quality. The interviewing and such like is a little bit <laughs> on the CBC level, so, but, it's, you know, uh, but there's some really funny things and a lot of music performances as well um, at the sub pub venue. Mm. Um, we have all the groups there, uh, Fan Lam, No Excuses, people like that. Um, people who, yeah, you may know, um, and we're finding that a lot of the people are coming up again and again, but you've got like school performances and different people. So too many people in this room are going to be in this, in this, in this, uh, in this, in this, in these films. We know we've got about seventy films now on YouTube. I just put them on last week, um, so we've already had about twenty views. So people are already going in and looking at them and checking them out, yeah. and. Um, you know, we know it's a great historic record of what was happening. Um, there's a lot of nostalgia and people who are going to be looking for themselves or people they know and that sort of thing. <laughs> you know, like there are more than others, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so I'm not looking at the, at the clothes and, and the hairstyles and things like that, but uh, it's any good. Yeah, and I think that the fun piece is that um, currently, as we said, they're in a, they're in a room in a cold war bunker and people don't have the machinery to be able to watch it. Whereas we digitize it, set it up for free online, and anyone can see it. And I think when we're talking about democracy of access and freedom of access, and when we're talking about how significant and important the archives are, this is the kind of thing that um, 
we believe very strongly in and all archives uh, hopefully are moving forward in understanding how vital it is to continue to uh, change with the times and respond to the community. So you'll see as we play this, it's just a little clip, um, and you'll see already the quality is deteriorating a little bit. And so we'll just play a little bit, and then you can imagine some of the other gems that we have in our collection. <laughs> I love the, the font. Yeah. It's good font. Good font. Uh -huh. 80s. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. The tumbling dice. Exactly. So wow. that's a little, just um, one clip, and it goes on and on and on. And I think that we could probably sit here and take another hour of your time and mm -hmm. show you all of these clips, and some of you might shield your eyes hoping you're not in them, whereas others might be excited <laughs> to see them. But I think, too, when we're looking at um, the difference, especially when we're talking about young individuals who might be learning about archives, and the level of excitement that can be generated with video content might be a little bit more exciting and a little bit more interactive and a little bit more approachable than perhaps a Nelson Daily News, uh, you know, a newspaper that we think is so exciting. But I think, again, when we're talking about the users of the archives, it's the full community. So we believe so strongly in the digitization. And, um, the video that we were going to show you was a benefit concert, and it was a little clip of an individual singing. Um, I think it was a song that almost out of time. It was about time. It was very fitting. It was about time running on and passing by and how as time goes by. As time goes by, that's right. And so as time goes by, we're going to lose these tapes, so we need to ensure that we're moving forward with digitization. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you. So I just a um, uh, question from uh, Councillor Page. Yeah, I think kind of directed towards uh, EJP. When we look at the considerations of the media being produced today, what is the library and archives considering at capturing the content of, the, of this digital age where we don't have a formalized channel collecting, curating, and putting in boxes yes. media that may deteriorate? This is yeah, it's ephemeral. Very, it's very tricky. It's only photographs that just on people's phones We do um, we do take photographs ourselves of what's around the community actually. Mm. So events going on. We've got a project to document um, this Nelson really in terms of going into different businesses and seeing what's there and seeing how they're looking um, and photographing those sort of records. So we've had sort of a, a bit of time capture in terms of time trying to capture that. Um, we also still collect things like newspapers and things like that. So we do do contemporary collecting. Um, we've got these things to do with COVID pandemic because we just knew that that was going to be something that's going to be people going to look uh, look at in the future as being uh, an important historic event for uh, Evan Nelson. Um, so we we do collect everything uh, but it is a bit uh, difficult sometimes and people um, don't think that the present is relevant in our time some people don't anyway but it, it is mm -hmm. it is because we just know it's going to be useful for us looking back in the future mm -hmm. may i add to that um, and i think too when we're talking about what's occurring now and the growth of the archives now mm -hmm. as jc said it's certainly contemporary Things, what's happening today, what's going to happen tomorrow, it's rec recognizing that the archives grows daily. It's necessary for it to grow daily. Mm -hmm. And so much of now we're seeing is individuals who are looking through perhaps family items that they don't think are important. Oh, my grandparents' photo album, gosh, what am I going to do with this? Right? And they think it's not useful to anyone perhaps beyond their family or they don't want to keep that kind of keepsake. It is, in fact, really valuable for us even to have those kinds of generational contents, mm -hmm. that, those last bits of photography, because you might be taking a photograph of your family at Lakeside Beach, and in the background is the bridge being built, or what's occurring mm -hmm. behind you, right? So there's so many things about the archives that um, 
that are personal, that are corporate, that are you know, recognizing all facets of life in the Nelsonite area. Mm. And so I think in terms of contemporary collecting, it's also looking at what collections do people have now mm. yeah. that they may not think are important, but to the museum and the archives, it's, it's really vital yeah. to continue to grow our collection. Yeah, and that's like saying, last week we put some photographs of the first um, uh, gay pride in Nelson mm. online in 1996, um, which um, fortunately somebody was taking photographs at that period. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we know that that's you know, a historic event, even though it's, people might say 96, that's too, too, too long. No. 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 And it certainly left a huge legacy. Mm. So, Thank you. Councillor, any other questions or anything? Yeah, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And every time I see you, I think, oh, I've got those Nelson High School yearbooks from like 1939 mm -hmm. that were my mother's that I must remember now. Because they're starting to talk about deteriorate. They're really starting to deter deteriorate in my basement. <laughs> exactly. We and, love that. <laughs> um, and a little, a little bit, yeah, including the things that were written. I don't know. I think I've got to edit some of the things that were... <laughs> written in 1939 in the back of a yearbook. Um, so uh, just a reminder that uh, for those that are listening and those that are here in the gallery, um, the uh, Nelson Museum Archives and Gallery love to expand its membership base. It's uh, relatively uh, inexpensive to join and become a member um, of the museum, and there's lots of perks for for, for doing that. And also for those that are feeling more generous, they um, do have a charitable um, status so they can give you um, a tax receipt. So always keep in mind um, Nelson Museum Archives and Gallery uh, when you're considering your yearly charitable um, donations. It's great when money can stay in town and help uh, organizations that we have here locally and hopefully you had a successful AGM. Do we have some new board members or a do, new chair? Indeed. Okay, do you want to tell us who the new members of your board are? Oh, sure. Yes, um, we have a really wonderful board and we were excited to welcome uh, to the team Nick Kostiak as the treasurer and then as directors we have Peter Boyg, uh, Nancy Subban, Linda Kalpin, and Chelsea Freita Yates. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I wish you all the best, as we all do, for your next year. And we look to see you um, coming back, not, not in a year's time, but for another update, we'll get the AV running. And I'm sure you'll be coming and bringing us other projects that you're working on um, during the course of the year. So thanks again for, for coming in and being our cultural event for the evening. Thanks Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Okay. And now moving on, we do have um, one delegation for... Um, this evening, like I mentioned earlier, our other delegation had to withdraw at the last moment. And so I'd like to call up uh, the delegation from Nelson uh, at its best. So I don't know if you're all going to come up. We can get a third chair there. If George, Annie, and Sean, if you're all going to um, come up, we can, we can get another chair in there for you. And then the only thing is to make sure that when you're speaking that your microphones are on. So, I think you push the button that Keith can probably, Keith, he's close. Am I pushing? Is that on? No, 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 are there, are there uh, microphones on? Okay. Is that on? Yeah, it's hard for us to, like, I can, I can hear you, but I don't know whether. Okay, so I'd like to welcome George, Annie, and Sean of Nelson at its best, and they're presenting to Council to provide an update on their findings in relation to their public spaces initiative report. So, over to you. Great, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to present to Council tonight. Um, we're from Nelson at its best. Um, I'm also sitting on the library board. And 
We want, are excited tonight to share our report on public space with you. Mm -hmm. Over the last year, Nelson at its best collaborated with the Nelson Public Library and with the participation of the Civic Theatre to deliver a project aimed at gathering feedback from the community on public spaces in Nelson. So we're here today to present a summary of the project and a snapshot of what we heard. Mm -hmm. The full report has re been provided to you <coughs> and to the City Planning Department. We shared the report with the planning department with the intent to support their work. So what is public space? Why are we talking about this? Recent events such as the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the importance of public space and experimenting with new ways of organizing it. As the city plans to update its official community plan, Nelson at its best believed that discussing public space was a community gap that needed addressing, that it would be beneficial for citizens from diverse backgrounds to weigh in on what public space means to them, setting the stage for a broader public discussion and consultation. Public spaces are accessible to all citizens and owned by the public. They serve the public good and promote social cohesion, making them crucial for healthy communities. Public spaces include open spaces, streets and sidewalks, and civic buildings. The project had three phases. The first phase was a launch event held at the Civic where participants watched videos and discussed ideas related to public spaces in Nelson. People were invited to put a sticker on a map of Nelson and area to indicate their well-used public spaces. And as an example, this short segment garnered a lot of in interest from our audience. We'll show you a short clip of this. It's entitled, How, do the, How the Dutch Cross the Street Safely. <laughs> There's a joke in there somewhere. <laughs> will we see this? <laughs> yes, we will. What happens if you hit? Hmm? It's the no tech night by the looks of things. <laughs> well, you click the link you and it bring it out a full screen. screen. Yeah. yeah. Is that showing? How do I get this to show? Uh, I do the thing where I don't actually do much with PowerPoints. <laughs> And then I guess, so, oh, yeah, okay. just this go is, to the link, I think. No, this is, let's get out of F11. No. I want it out of, like, oh, there we go. Get over here. I don't want to spot the video. And over here. Oh. And then I do it like that. And then you let it. And then I do the thing, and then I push the thing. <laughs> Next. 
the struggle is real. Gremlins have appeared. There we go. That's, good. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Great. So first we had the event at the Civic, and then the second phase followed 10 park bench conversations held in parks, backyards, and at the Nelson Public Library, followed by an online survey. Participants answered questions about what public spaces they use and why, and their big ideas for fostering the well-being of Nelson's residents through public space. 62 people participated in these park benches conversations, and the survey garnered 571 responses. You can see that the majority of respondents lived within the city limits. And we're now in the final phase of the project, reporting out to council tonight, the city planning department today, and to the community at large at the public library on May 29th. So what did we hear during our community engagement? The community conversations and survey revealed that Nelson's open spaces, such as parks, trails and beaches, are heavily used and appreciated by people. However, there is potential for significant improvement in the streets, sidewalks and other connected areas. Three clear themes emerged from our survey and conversations. Connectivity, accessibility and pedestrian-centred downtown, with significant, with, with significant overlap between them. These themes are aligned with the adaptation and mitigation strategies within Nelson Next, the City of Nelson's Climate Action Plan, as well as the Sustainable Waterfront and Downtown Master Plan and the Downtown Urban Design Strategy. Overall, the residents of Nelson enjoy many of the existing public spaces in the city but they believe that by improving connectivity between these places, they can create a more vibrant and connected community that fosters the well-being of its residents. Examples of improved connectivity include linking Cottonwood Falls and the Dog Walk, widening and greening the path adjacent to Lakeside Drive and the Chaco Micamore parking lot between the Prestige Lakeside Resort and Lakeside Park. Also popular are improving John's Walk to Red Sands Beach, and upgrading the access to Gyro Park and Vernon Street by paving the path and adding appropriate signage. Respondents described the contiguous, well-shaded and inviting route that includes a variety of amenities such as washrooms, cafes and mini parks. They also suggested linking a car-free Hall Street Plaza to the lake via a well-shaded, pedestrian-friendly route down Hall Street. Additionally, Respondents hope for safe and accessible active, active transportation routes connecting downtown to Rosemont and downtown to Lions Park with the potential for neighborhood amenities like cafes along the way. Improved wayfinding, which was recently presented to council, was, was mentioned as a way to help visitors and remind locals of destinations and amenities in the city. Respond respondents believe that safe and continuous sidewalks and crosswalks Accessible and well-maintained public washrooms, free shuttle service connecting outskirts parking to the downtown, and publicly accessible rest areas are important components of an integrated, accessible, human-scale city. The goal is to create a sense of community and provide access to resources that may not be available in one area, while allowing for more efficient use of resources and providing a safe and secure environment for people to enjoy. The accessibility theme refers to the ease of access and to feeling safe in public spaces. Factors such as maintenance, lighting, design, comfort, and community use were identified as affecting the sense of safety in public spaces. Snow removal was highlighted as a significant barrier to accessibility and safety, particularly for those with walkers, strollers, and scooters, and respondents called for better snow clearance on sidewalks and roads. A range of solutions was proposed, including improved connectivity via public transportation, trails and sidewalks, such as a shuttle bus between Baker and the mall, and a trail that connects the mountain station to Baker Street. Respondents also highlighted the need for cycling safety measures and more public washrooms in parks and downtown. 
including inside public and semi-public buildings. The library, a public space with public washrooms, was seen as, as an essential part of the city's social infrastructure, with strong support for a new and larger library. Some respondents expressed concern about the perceived threat from vulnerable people in public spaces and called for more support for the transient population to reduce the need to hang out onto the streets and parks. And finally, in regards to accessibility, we heard that while people enjoy the private patios downtown, they want to ensure that they don't limit access to our public spaces. Overall, uh, responses indicated a very significant desire for a more human scale, walkable downtown Nelson that prioritizes the need of pedestrians over cars. This is in line with current research and practice, which suggests that a more walkable city is a healthier city, physically, mentally, and socially, and even a happy city, as one well-known book is titled. A pedestrian-focused urban environment can also benefit the local economy by attracting more foot traffic to shops, restaurants, and other businesses, and perhaps getting offline shopping a little bit. <laughs> so we broke this down into um, three, three subcategories. First one is a car-free Baker Street. There is a very strong appetite for a car-free Baker Street to some degree in some fashion It's in some time. Some people advocated for permanent pedestrian-only areas. Many others called for temporary closures, a certain period of the day or days. They cited Victoria as an example. Seasonal, like from May to October. People cited Banff and Canmore as current examples or designated day or days of the week, or even car-free days as has been presented by John Alton to this council. Whatever the configuration, this feature would create a safer, more pleasant environment for pedestrians and encourage more active transportation options like walking and cycling. People also cited other Canadian experiences from Vancouver, Kelowna, Kimberley, Quebec City, Halifax, as well as European countries. In addition to the earlier mentioned shuttle service, which would cut down on the number of cars needing to be downtown, two other traffic calming measures were suggested. The video clip that you saw, obviously, it, it literally drew gasps and awes from people at the Civic <laughs> Theater, kind of like, oh, that would be so nice. So this kind of strategy and infrastructure would reinforce the perception that this part of downtown is focused on pedestrians, on their health, on their safety, and on their enjoyment. The second, and I took this slide uh, a couple of weeks ago, I actually had to stop to let a truck out in order to take this slide, was comments around angle parking. A lot of people are suggesting we eliminate angle parking on Baker Street, um, which would cut down on the number of vehicles in, that blo in those blocks. Another suggestion was around imposing a vehicle length restriction to prevent longer vehicles, trucks in particular, protruding too far into the street. This is dangerous to other vehicles, to cyclists, not to mention those of us who don't necessarily go to crosswalks to cross the street. It probably is all of us at some point. The respondents demonstrated, I would say, almost a yearning for a public square or park in downtown. It was expressed very often and very strongly that this is an important theme for people. This would provide a much needed community space for people to gather, to socialize, and participate in events and activities in the downtown core. The two existing locations that were most mentioned are on the screen, City Hall Plaza and Hall Street Plaza identified as potential locations for these public squares with suggestions for more greenery, fewer hard surfaces, and more seating to encourage social interaction and community engagement. During the uh, park bench conversations that I facilitated, there was quite a bit of an excitement over this drawing from the city's 2017 urban design strategy document showing a potential flexible pop-up town square at the corner of Ward and Baker. It was a new and awe moment during those conversations. Can we just, one sec? Yes. Can I have clarification? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this is called a scramble. Is that correct? <coughs> it could I don't be think that's the picture of the scramble, is it? It was a scramble intersection.
George pointed out, it, it was meant to create flexible space that you would close and use as a plaza for events, etc. Like that. So it's uh, it was two things: a scramble uh, interchange and a, and also to be able to be used as a plaza. So it, it would still have stoplights, mm -hmm. but it, yep. if you wanted to have an event, right? Uh -huh. and those ballers would be tracked into the, into the road. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll just pick them up. No, I think they were talking about retractable ones. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Just to correct their retractable. People did talk about scrambled intersections too, as if you have they continuous sidewalks, right. then it might be easier yeah. just to have like the cops uh, that as one of the traffic good. signals. So to summarize, participants strongly value and enjoy our existing public spaces, as Sean and Annie <coughs> mentioned. And they have lots of ideas on how to make them even better, but they want better access, more options, and greater cohesion. Public space and social infrastructure are vital components of a community's social fabric, providing resources needed for social connections and community well-being. To create more vibrant, inclusive, and resilient communities, policymakers need to invest in these resources and ensure their equitable distribution. There are examples from around the globe showing how addressing and maintaining connectivity, accessibility, and pedestrian centeredness ensure an accelerated transition to low carbon resilience. As Sean mentioned, the themes emerging from our survey and from the conversations align in many ways with a lot of the existing city documents, also including Nelson Path to 2040 sustainable strategy. To enhance public space, we encourage city council, city staff, and business owners to adopt a more experimental approach with smaller, cheaper, quicker projects and initiatives that can be piloted and evaluated for their impacts. This approach, including a process also known as rapid implementation, can inform ideas that have been tried and adopted elsewhere, but need to be tailored to a specific context of Nelson. This experimental approach is relevant to all of the themes, the three themes that we talked about, but probably particularly so around the three elements that I talked about under pedestrian center downtown. By adopting this approach, Nelson can continue to improve its public spaces, foster social connections, and support community well-being. A lot of Nelson and area residents weighed in on this issue, demonstrating that they care about public space as an important element of community life and they have lots of ideas on how to strengthen it. There are some ideas that maybe don't fit easily into these three themes, but they would possibly be more likely if we focused on these three themes. Things like arts and culture and music presentations, festivals, business amenities along connecting paths and so on. We hope the results of this project will be a valuable source of input for the renewal of Nelson's official community plan and also support the adaptation strategies of the Nelson Next Climate Action Plan. We encourage you to look at the report if you haven't had uh, a chance to. And we did provide uh, the planning department with the raw data, which is a pretty interesting read. If you want to get nerdy about it, there's a lot in there. And if you do, just let us know. We can pass it on. I read it. I read all of them this morning. It took me two hours, and it was uh, it was really incredible to see you. So thanks for your time, and we're happy to answer any questions. Councillor Tate, then Councillor Lockerbie. Speaking of the data, um, did you happen to gather any demographics of the 571 respondents, age, income, <clears throat> education, ability? Thanks, Kate. Um, no, we didn't. We asked where they lived, but I think if I was to do it again, another survey, I would ask that question just to have a range of, you know, um, age groups, um, perhaps business owners, residents, where they work, that kind of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Council Dr. Mark. I, uh, <clears throat> thank you for that. I absolutely love it. Love everything about it. Love the vision, love the ideas, and, and love the idea of rapid implementation. I think you wrote, wrote it down. Oh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I live. <laughs> I, uh, I would love to see us uh, partner with the community, maybe, you know, with your support. Um, to pilot in some selected neighborhoods some of these ideas. I'm, I'm certainly, you know, we heard from John Alton, as he said, about um, a car-free Baker Street, say, once or twice uh, in the, hopefully, coming soon on a Sunday, some Sunday. That's the kind of rapid Im implementation uh, I'd love to see. 
And uh, in part, I think what we need to move to in terms of getting this, you know, experiment with our public spaces and find the best and highest use of these public spaces is also recognizing the interconnectivity of everything. So that if um, we're building an effective pedestrian friendly or pedestrian first community, we recognize that it, the connections have to be there. You can't have part of a connection to really understand if it's gonna work mm -hmm. or not. Overall, it's, it's an integrated system. So um, I, th I think it's gonna take some open-mindedness, some regular communication, and certainly a regular and consistent partnership with Nelson at its best and, and, and other public groups. So thank you for taking the leadership on this. I think it's really great. Councilor Edward. Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah, I just, I just want to say on a sort of personal anecdotal level, you know, when, um, when I was running the markets for all those years, something I did recognize very clearly was when I shut the street down, uh, that, and then the tents came in and then the people filled in, there was like this complete different energy. I, I always saw people's shoulders going down, um, kids were running around without fear. Um, parents were relaxed because they didn't have to monitor their kids as much. And I think, yeah, I think that there is a, it was really visceral actually. And I remember like I would stand in the middle of a closed off section of, of Baker Street and just kind of feel that because uh, it was rare. Because it was, you know, everything is, it was done in periods of time, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I know, I know there is challenges with doing that with the business community and with transit um, parking, uh, the elderly. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a bunch of results from shutting a street down. So there's, you know, both positive and some negative mm -hmm. to that. But um, I would say there was a, uh, a real psychological component to uh, like a health because people could actually see each other and they weren't worrying about vehicle traffic. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to put that out there as like a, you know, for a general health of our community. Um, I know we do have markets. We do the markets now, and and when you go there, you see that energy. Um, but it would be really interesting to look at uh, what they're doing in Canmore, which is like uh, in the summertime, they'll take a street or two, and it's it's uh, temporary. They'll put out like uh, planter pots and benches mm -hmm. and stuff. And uh, I was there last summer, and it was it was really an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of the things about the rapid implementation that really does fit into lighter, quicker, and cheaper pilots and temp trying things out and seeing how they work. Mm -hmm. uh, North Vancouver and um, Burnaby were wondering about bike lanes, and rather than do a survey or hire a company to give an ex investigation of possibilities, they just did quick and dirty lines and plastic ballers, and then they asked people about bike lanes. Mm -hmm. And it was more real, and they found that cars were... With, more willing to admit that they were not so bad, mm -hmm. car drivers, mm -hmm. and, and they were able to see mm -hmm. where the limits were and what the possibilities, and didn't cost much at all. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of approach, you know, we met with the planning department today and, and we all agreed it's gonna be small things, try it out and mm -hmm. see how they work, because mm -hmm. it is, there are a lot of uh, competing pressures on a city, and there are a lot of things that people want. But I think with 650 people weighing in, and we hope some of these people will weigh in on the official community plan, because obviously these are people that care about what our public space is enough to take the time to fill out a questionnaire that was not quantitative, it was qualitative. It took some energy to write things down. Mm -hmm. So I think people do care and they do have lots of ideas and they do want to be part of it. And uh, you guys know, because you step forward yourselves to be elected officials, stepping forward and taking action is part of a democracy. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are willing to do that. I think too, Jesse, <clears throat> that um, there's a lot of uh, research out there about relating public space, green spaces with healthy, happy cities or happy mm -hmm. communities too. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of correlation between that that supports it. Also supports the bird friendly city as well. <laughs> Ties it all in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Councilors, any further questions? Okay, seeing none then I want to thank Annie, Sean, and George mm -hmm. for coming tonight and um, presenting the latest findings from Nelson and its best. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, yes, I think that we mentioned the OCP, that process is coming up and hopefully um, soon we'll be seeing um, who's been selected to sit on that committee and <coughs> hopefully amongst your groups that, that you're with that you've been encouraging people to put their name forward to um, potentially be on the OCP committee, but it's, um, it's presentations and work that you're doing like this that help help inform some of those discussions and um, George, you talked about social infrastructure and it was, uh, and then we heard about inclusion and equity and we did just spend three days in strategic planning and those were all words that um, percolated uh, quite readily to the top of, of uh, most of our discussions um, last week. So um, there's some key notes that continue to echo mm -hmm. as we uh, move forward. So thank you very much again for coming this evening and giving us your presentation. Thank you for giving us time. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Okay, councillors, we are at... I think we're going to break a record. We are at... We have no late <laughs> items. Right. And so that means that we're at number 15, resolution to adjourn. Does anybody want to adjourn? <laughs> Councillor Woodward. So move. Second by Councillor um, Page. All those in favor of adjournment? Uh, against and that carries. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, councillors, for the Thanks, evening. Sir. Thank you very much for um, the audience and those that stayed for the whole um, evening. I uh, met with a group at the cemetery yesterday. Thanks, and I walked over to the tech, walked over there from our place, mm -hmm. and then came all the way down uh, this is to Stanley so, Street. This is really beautiful. It's back it's really place. beautifully done. Very beautiful. Wow. Yeah. The font, the type, everything. I've noticed everything around the crowd. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I guess they would call it half They can't do it, Jesse. Like, yeah. 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 But, but yeah, really, no really well done. Totally right. And I'm just like, I'm just coming down from the yeah. Hill Market, I'm like, oh, is that work on? Even by the school bus itself, nothing. It's like, it's like, like, like on this side of the street, and then it's on that side of the street, and then it has a boulevard, and it doesn't, and it's like, somebody mentioned it. We don't need sidewalks on every side. But we need good sidewalks on one side everywhere. Okay. Continuous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the shift that was of amazing. viewing a city as a pedestrian, as the city for people that's why I think the instead of a vehicle, right? Oh, we'll, put the, we'll put the sidewalk over there because we don't have whatever. I think it's more just like certain neighborhoods have gone through two different cycles where some have been like through local improvements that I would like a sidewalk. Wow. Like I noticed one was gone just because there was a retaining wall that nobody wanted to like move the retaining wall yeah. in and yes. continue it by. Definitely. And then other ones are like we started to do the like well we don't have to do them everywhere. So some were like let's take it out instead of renewing it. But then the street next door doesn't do it. And then and so you get this hodgepodge. I love the idea of trying out varieties of bike lanes to get people just try it. Like that one. Let's try it. Let's do the cones and let's you know that's what we could be doing this this, can someone write that to Matt Kuziak? Is that it for you, Justin? But I mean, but that's where that, that's where it can be temporary, right? Because permanent, permanently here is a bit difficult. You could get away the street. Okay, because I just have to do that. Well, have a good time wherever you go. Every so often, but I'll be hearing everything Storm does, so I'll be up because of that. Yeah. 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 What, I, what works for me may not work for you. It's not to say, it's not to say that, that, that we can't yeah. contemplate yeah. these things. Yeah. It's not that they never contemplate, it's just that it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's not necessarily an on or an off or a yes or a no. It should, should be better. It definitely is about flexibility. I know she wants to talk about it more. Yeah. Okay. All right, then.